know. There it is. Thank you, Isaiah. Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you out to Leatherwood Church on a Wednesday night. And uh, we, we're so glad that you're, you're here this evening. You have a couple of announcements. Uh, actually, just one. Um, actually, two. The first is, if you've got a hankering for like a cookie or a couple dozen slices of pie, if you sneak down the back stairs and go grab one, there'll be no judgment whatsoever. But if, if that's you, or even after service, just head on down there. There are a few slices of pie and a few dozen cookies left. And uh, I think uh, Wayne has a way here in a little bit to give out uh, some of the other extras uh, that we have. But uh, uh, just help yourself. Uh, also, uh, we made this announcement last night. If you're here, the Red Man Valley Church Association and the First Church of God are providing a child protection seminar uh, based off the new laws in Pennsylvania. That'll be June 6th. Uh, from 10 to 4 at the New Bethlehem First Church of God. And you can call the church office for more information. Anybody else have any other announcements tonight? Alright, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much. Uh, we're so grateful to be in your house. Father, we are so excited to see what you're going to do tonight. Lord, we pray for Wayne. We pray that you uh, just open up the word through him. And Father God, we just pray that mighty things would be done in your name. Amen. Stand up and say hello to someone who's around you. <laughs>
tonight we are going to be taking up an offering uh, for Circle C Ranch. Uh, Circle C Ranch is where uh, Wayne has his uh, summer camp and snow camp ministry and, and many other things. And uh, he's got some information to pass out uh, if you have children between the ages of 8 and 18 uh, that are looking for a place to go to summer camp. Uh, he's got information for that, uh, and he's going to tell you a little bit about their ministry here. So we can have the ushers come forward. If you have a check, you can make it out to Leatherwood Church, and we'll be sure that, that Wayne gets that for the, the Circle C. Uh, but uh, Andy, would you just, just have a prayer over the offering for this evening? Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for blessing each one of us here with your word. Thank you for blessing on Circle C Ranch, Lord. Those willing to do your will, Lord, just ask a special prayer of this offering. May you use it to send forth your word, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Oh, no, I just can't be um, First of all, it's good to be here again with you guys. Uh, tell you a little bit about. Circle Sea Ranch, we started 47 years ago. Um, my dad started it. A God laid on his heart as a 19 year old to start a camp. He did. Uh, it was a cow pasture when he took it over, and now uh, it's a western town. I have some brochures up here if you want one. If you're all yours, if you want to know more about what the camp's about, go to our website. We have all kinds of videos that can show you highlights. We have videos that explain stuff. Um, we also make movies that we use as teaching tools to not only talk about reading your Bible, praying, and salvation. And what we do with those is we make them very engaging, lots of action and excitement. And in the process, we teach the lessons. And so kids see it lived out. And at camp, if a kid promises to show the movie to someone who doesn't know Christ, we give it to them for free. And they get to take it home. I have some with me. If you'd like to check any of those out, I'd be glad to give them to you. Um, enjoy the, the big show. Also, every kid that comes to summer camp leaves with a Bible mark to know how to lead someone to Christ. Our mission statement is real simple. Reach kids to Christ and teach them how to reach their friends. That's it. That's our main focus. Now, we do that in a whole lot of ways. We have all kinds of crazy games. We have an 80-foot by 200-foot giant slip and slide. We call it a slope and slide. Uh, Laser Tron Arena. Um, Rock walls, horses, pools, all kinds of fun that will attract kids and also show them that Christianity is fun. Yes, it has all those other aspects, but ultimately, Satan didn't create fun. God did. Satan perverted it, God perfected it. So we show them that Christianity is a lot of fun and how to live out their faith. So if you have any questions about Circle C, please feel free to, to ask me. Um, now, I was asked to try and get rid of some of this extra food. So, we're going to play a little game. Um, it's a game we do sometimes, my brother and I, they're called road shows. We take sometimes going to public schools, to Bible clubs, and we'll do improv, comedy, and skits, and stuff. That's a way of presenting the gospel. And part of that, oh, that was a story, okay. Um, one of the games we play, and you're all going to get to play this, so if you're like, I don't, I don't want to do it, but you can help someone else win food prizes. It's called a personal scavenger hunt. I am going to call out an item, and if you have it on your person, you bring it up and you put it in my hand, you get to choose what food item you want to take home. All right, it's that simple. So we'll start easy and say, how about a, uh, a quarter from before the year 2000? Quarter from before the year 2000. It has 19 something something. People are going furiously through their change. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, let me see, let me see. Oh goodness. Oh yeah, that's an old, that's 19, 1984. You're a graduate from high school. Congratulations, sir. There is a variety of food. Go pick one. All right, excellent. How about a comb? Comb. Not a brush, comb. <laughs> Whoa! That's nifty. Congratulations. Oh, Alright, how about a photo ID? 
photo ID. Any kind of photo ID. Nobody has a photo ID. How did you get your ID? Oh, look at that. Oh, that's a good picture, man. You're looking good at that one. All right, go. Help yourself and get the Tostitos or the cookies. And once, go in for the space of, all right, we're down in the Tostitos. That's all that's left. How about a piece of gum? Preferably on chew. <laughs> Still in the wrap would be ideal. Okay, because I really don't want it in my hand. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's all you have? Perfect. Try that. Good one. All right. We got one more. One more. Um, let's see. What else? How about a piece of jewelry or something with a Disney character on it? Anyone? Anyone got a Disney character? No, no Disney characters, really. We're more of a Warner Brothers church. <laughs> I don't know, I just realized this because this wasn't planned. But there's someone sitting right in front of me that has Disney stuff on. We got the princesses. I can believe we got you had that. I'm great. <laughs> there you go, you guys enjoy yourselves. All right. <laughs> Tonight we're going to do something definitely different you've probably never done in church before. I'm pretty sure you haven't, because I haven't. But we're going to give it a try. Because I want to communicate something in a way that's going to really hit home with us. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the truth of the Bible we get used to? I mean, it's almost like, well, Jesus died for you. is like, yeah, okay, that's nice. Pass me a glass of water. And it doesn't really connect. Tonight? want to connect. So we're going to look at some, some fairly heavy duty stuff and then bring around the application of what we do when we leave this building. It's not enough to sit here and go, oh yes, that's correct, that's true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let's go and be unchanged. The Word of God is powerful and living and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's got to change us. I don't know if you've ever Bless you, right? I'm not sure what that was. Um, I have a girl in my church when she sneezes. It is so loud it echoes. Keeps everyone awake. It's awesome. Um, I don't know if you've ever run into a sword before. Anyone ever have a close encounter with a large blade? Okay, I did once. Fortunately, the guy I was doing the sword fight with for the movie was very strong. Because I had this really cool one. It was a handheld one with a blade sticking out. And he had this really big, heavy duty, able to cut like a bolt that big in half. That's what those advertisements were. Now people say, well, if you're gonna do fights, why don't you use fake swords? Because <laughs> they're more expensive. So we got the real ones. So we were doing this really intense fight sequence, and I go up and I'm supposed to catch the sword, and I missed. And he stopped it just as it was touching at my flesh. I was like, <gasps> Oh man, I'm so glad you're strong. Because that would, I don't know if he'd have locked my arm off, it wasn't that sharp, but it would have broken a couple things for sure. A whole new respect for the sword and the fight sequence. Once you have that run in, we have a run in with the Word of God, it should change us. So, we're going to divide you all in half, right down the middle. So, be this half, gets this half. I need. A volunteer from each have to represent their team in a competition. And it'd probably be best if, you know, this is more of a rednecky type of competition. So, those of you who are, yeah, I'm redneck, I can do it. Good. So, did I see your hand up, sir? Yes, I think I did. Yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on. You're for me. Oh, man. I need someone over here. Anthony. Where's Anthony? Who are we talking about? Someone's just yelling at Anthony. How do you know? And I made a purchase at the Walmart in Clarion. That's right, this is going to be a shooting competition. Because we're going to see who's the best. Now, we have, in case you were wondering, it doesn't shoot real bullets, it's just a little pointy dark things. But you're going to get four shots, bolt action, okay? So, since you got chosen first, you got four shots, you're going to go back to right between those two pews right there where there's that gap. So go there, and I'm going to tell you what you're shooting at. <laughs> you're going to shoot at me. Whichever one of you hits me the most, 
You say it wins, and I'll tell you in a minute what you won. This is where it gets exciting. You gotta pull it all the way back. You gotta pop the ball down, yank it. Yeah, I had a little trouble the first time, too. All right, you can come, come forward. It doesn't really shoot that part. Okay, that's good. Shoot me. It didn't shoot. Okay, I was ready. I was so ready. I was ready to get shot. There you go, okay. You're killing me, man. It worked earlier. I was shooting stuff. Oh, nice try. Oh. Yeah, good advice. <laughs> that went to a hey, Meyer. Thank you. Oh, hit the microphone. Dude. That's a good idea. You're right. Oh, got me again. He's got two. One more shot. See if you can do a three for four. It's going to be tough to beat. You're up, I mean, you can perform darts. It's a sneaky one. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, what'd you do at those special church meetings? You shot the speaker. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't go. Alright. Go for it a little bit. Here you go. Wherever you're comfortable, sure. That's good. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh. Uh oh. This could be trouble. He misses one more game over. No pressure though. Okay. Yeah, I understand. The wind threw you off. Gotcha. <laughs> See, if it comes down to you get it, whoever's supposed to be, who is most accurate? So. Oh! I don't think it matters. This time wins. Congratulations. And right now you're wondering, what did I just win? Well, in our little game, not in reality, important to know the difference. In our little game, the winners get to be the same people, you get to go to heaven. Woo. Yeah, that's okay, big time for that. Losers, not so much. Um, but wait, there, there is a positive side. I'm lying, there's no positive side. You missed it. Here's the thing, in our world, we are separated. Those that are going to heaven, those that are going to hell. And it's all based on whether or not We've invited Christ into our lives and have chosen to follow him. It's not based on whether or not we actually pray a prayer. It's based on what we do with that. But there are consequences for both. And as Jesus said, man, count the cost. Make sure you know what you're up against. Make sure you are ready. Make sure you know what the consequences are going to be. So we start with you guys. The redeemed. Things are pretty good for you in the afterlife or everything. Um, first, John 14, 1 through 3, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Here's the thing, he's saying, I am going away, and I'm going to prepare mansions. Now, it took him six days to make the entire universe, and he's been working on the mansions for 2,000 years. Wow. So, what you guys get to experience, and I want to kind of give you a first person thing, you get up to heaven, God takes and says, hey, here's what I made just for you. So you're walking in, and it is a mansion designed specifically for you because he designed you specifically according to Ephesians 2.10. You are experiencing something not only perfect, but perfectly specific for you. Exactly however that would be. Whatever God knows, you say, well, I really want it this way. Well, God may know you better than you know yourself. And he's going to make it perfect. According to Revelation 7, 
16 17, you're not going to hunger or thirst anymore. The sun will not strike you nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Here's the deal you're never going to be hungry. So your future is going to be, man, I'm not hungry, I'm not thirsty, I'm not getting sunburned. Don't you hate getting sunburned? I hate because I'm being a diabetic, it, it messes up my diabetes, and it just. Not only does it hurt, it makes me feel miserable. This is not no fun, zero fun. No worries of that. That's her. and when we think anything that might ever make us sad, God says, "I'm gonna wipe away those tears. You are gonna be at peace. It's gonna be perfect." One more verse for you. And the twelve gates, talking about the New Jerusalem. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each gate was made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. What's your future going to be? Thanks you. It's incredible. Shooting? Well, it's going to be you're walking on a street of gold. Everything is perfect. You just went by these massive gates, and the best thing you can compare them to is like this giant pearl. They're amazing. They're ginormous. They're huge. And we get to check them out all the time. We're walking around with our friends. Everything is perfect. I'm not hungry. I'm not thirsty. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's perfect. See, we go through a lot here on this earth, some believers more than others. But when we choose to go against our culture and we choose to follow Jesus, <coughs> that's what we get to spend in eternity. You see, this life right now, we tend to get all caught up in it. It's kind of silly. It really is. Think about it. If you're on the planet, if you're on the planet for 100 years, you're probably going to make the news. But then you're in heaven or hell forever. You can't even begin to describe that or comprehend forever because everything we know has a beginning and an end. And when we start thinking about forever, it's never, ever going to end. It's overwhelming to think God has perfection laid out. And I love it because some kids come in and say, you look going to get boring. I mean, it's the same thing over there. Isn't going to get boring? It's like, all right, let, let's think about this for a second. The most creative being that you can't even begin to imagine, God. He is unlimited creativity. There's nothing he can't do. There's nothing that can stop him. He can create stuff our minds can't even imagine. When Paul saw it, and said, I can't describe it to you. There are not words that... I can't even describe what I saw. Let me tell you a little bit about your heaven. And I can prove to you there's no way you can even imagine it. I can prove to you right now, you cannot imagine heaven. Our world has four dimensions. That's what we live in. Height, width, depth, and time. Those are our four dimensions. That's what we exist in. If we could add one more space dimension, we can do something real cool, and I want you to picture this in your mind, okay? Your head may hurt just a little bit. If it starts to hurt, you can stop, okay? Um, picture a ball, no hole, no seam. Go there. And in your mind, I want you to turn it inside out without breaking the surface of the ball. Go ahead. Right now, you're going, what? <laughs> That's impossible! In the little four-dimensional world we live in, yes, but you had one more space dimension, you can do it. You had another space dimension, you can stand outside this church, look that way, and see the back of the church without mirrors. You're going, okay, I don't even get that, you're right. And that's why we had in two dimensions. God has unlimited dimensions to play with. How is it ever going to be boring? Are you kidding me? What we have coming is awesome. And as amazing as that is on that end, Equally as amazing, only in the horrific side, is the other end. Those who don't know Christ, when they die without Jesus. The Bible tells us quite a bit. First of all, there's a tribulation they're going to have to go through. Revelation 6 tells us that he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, and the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth, as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale, the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. A couple days ago, there was an earthquake in Nepal, and it's been all over the news. And they're thinking it could be up to 10,000 people were killed because of this earthquake. 
I didn't feel it. I don't think you did either. He's talking about an earthquake that every mountain, every island is going to be moved. A worldwide earthquake. And if you look at those images coming from the water, like, wow, that's horrible. I can't imagine being trapped. I can't imagine. Folks, without Christ, and you go into that tribulation period, that's just one of many that come. Also, there is the lake of fire. Those of you who are theologically inclined, hell is sort of like a holding pen. There's fire, there's torment, but that is not the end. The end is much worse. The lake of fire is horrible. And it talks about the lake of fire in Revelation 20. It says, The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and so forth, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. I remember when I went to college, some guys said, well, I don't believe the hell is really made up of fire. I think it's all, you know, symbolic. And so we, I did the research, and I said, I don't know, I don't think it's fire. Bob said it is. But either way, it's horrific. Forever. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. I'm just going to hit a couple of verses here. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from his presence, earth and sky fled away. There was no place found for them. He who was sitting on the great white throne is Jesus Christ. It's a final judgment. Everyone, all humanity, will be in the great white throne. Judgment room. Now, believers, you guys, <laughs> it says, do not know the saints will judge the world. You are all going to be there. But you're not being judged. You agree with the judgment. As God goes one at a time through, we, as believers, say, Amen, so be it. Everyone else has ever lived. One at a time appeared before the great white throne and the books were opened, evidently explaining their lives, showing them their lives. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And verse 15 puts it this way, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire, bound hand and foot. Start to picture that for a minute. It gets a little terrifying. It gets a little terrifying when you think of the people you know and you care about who do not know our Savior. It can almost make you panic. It should, but it can. And the fact that that is a reality, that that dark, like, it says it's absolute darkness and pure flame. And people say, well, I'm going to go to hell and party with my friends. No, you're not. You're going to be completely by yourself forever. Bound head and foot. You may hear them scream, but you're not going to be with them. And it's certainly not going to be a party. That's the reality of the Bible. The Bible doesn't give that to us to scare us. Hmm. Second Peter 3.11. All these things will be destroyed in this way. So think what kind of holy and godly lives you must live. He's telling us this. So say, hey, wake up, man. This is coming. What kind of life should you be living? What should people be seeing in you? Do you want know something? We get caught up in this little world we live in. And we get caught up in our own little needs and our own little selfishness. And I want to be accepted. I want people to like me. And I, I don't want people to say bad things about me. And that becomes our God. I know. It has in my life. When I was in high school, there was this kid named Tommy. He was much shorter than I was. He was a year older than me. And uh, we, had, we weren't like tight friends. It's not like we hung out or anything. But we had gym classes together. And so we'd goof around. He'd like, we'd play basketball. He'd dribble right through my legs because he was so short. And then we'd entertain people. And it was fun. He's a nice kid. I don't remember a whole lot of conversations I had with him, although I did have a few. <laughs> he graduated. I became a senior. My senior year, I had one of the leads in the high school musical. And I remember running from one side of the stage during a rehearsal through the foyer to get to the other side because I had to come on the other side. And so I was coming through, Tommy would come back to visit. And I'm like, Tommy, how you doing, man? This is good, Wayne, how are you? Great. Things are not, but you know, it's good. So I said, I gotta get to the other side of the stage. I'll talk to you later, right? I said, yeah, sure, we'll catch up later. And I took off. That was the last time I saw Tommy. You see, it was in February, and it was one of those warm, kind of warmer February nights, it was real foggy, and he'd stopped at a gas station on his way walking home to, to get something to eat. He's walking down the road, it's kind of foggy. The truck never saw him until it hit him. Killed instantly. I remember I was working up at snow camp and I was doing some shoveling <coughs> and I was trying to keep the snow on the Jupiter Hill. 
And one of my friends comes and says, hey, did you hear about Tommy? I'm like, no, what? So he was killed tonight. I'm like, what? Yeah, I didn't sleep that night. Because I knew something. I knew I'd never told him. I'd never said a word. There may never have been an opportunity for me to. That's very possible, but I know I wasn't even looking for it. When I went to college, I was in charge of student chapels my senior year. And I was like, guys, I want to do something that's going to be kind of different. We did a lot of things different. And I always go to the Bible props after chapel and say, so did I screw it up? And they go, well, it was very non-traditional. Well, no, you were right. Everything was right. I'm like, what? So yeah, I want to be non-traditional. Because traditionalists, people come in, they listen, they go, oh, that was very good. He's a good speaker. I like him. Let's go. I'm like, no, 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 no. I want them leaving the building going, I'm either going for God or against God. And I know. So we did unique stuff. One of those things is I told my testimony about Tommy. I said, I'm going to give you two testimonies. One's true, one isn't. First one we did in gym class in the locker room, Tommy asked the question and we started talking. And in my testimony, because we acted part of it out and I told part of it, he became a Christian. That night he still was killed by the truck. But when I went to the funeral home, I could tell his mom, I know where your son is. Let me tell you why. I could tell my friends, I know where Tommy is. Let me tell you why. And then we did the future one where Tommy, I showed up in heaven and Tommy comes running up and you know, jumps on me and says, hey, where have you been? I've been waiting for you. And I turned around and said, sorry, I didn't want to be a hood ornament like someone else. You know, we started joking around and laughed and it was great. And when I got done with that part, I said, but here's the truth, that's a dream, that's not reality. Let me tell you how it happened. Tommy asked a question, I ignored it because I was too consumed with me. He still died. And the reality was, I did go to the funeral home. And I told his mother, I'm so sorry, but I had nothing else to tell her. I tried to comfort my friends, but I had nothing to tell them. Because I had been about me. I dropped the ball. You all know someone. So you did the end of the story, which was uh, Revelation 2015 part. Where Tommy was taken to hell and screaming at me the entire time, why didn't we say something? That may happen so. That may be my future. My future is my fault. I made choices I made. Your future is your fault. What choices have you made? What choices are you making? What do we have to do? When you start reading some of this stuff and you get a hold of how horrific it is, our natural tendency is to panic, right? Take my Bible, start thumping people over the head. Hey, pow, repent, you're gonna burn. <laughs> Wrong answer. Okay, that never has worked. You know, I even have some friends that I know of. They they were trying to help this Bible club, this one school, and they had this great idea of writing on their face, repent or burn, and went around school. I'm like, are you serious? It's not what people need. So here's the deal. You can't save anybody. Neither can I. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Now, he will choose to use us when we are lined up in obedience with him. But it's his job. It's not ours. I can tell someone about Christ, and that's all I'm commanded to do. So let's take a look at, um, real quick, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do to reach somebody? Let me tell you what you need to do. Straight from the word of God. Number one, you pray for them. You pray for them consistently, every day, throughout your day. You pray for that person who doesn't know Christ. Get serious about it. Not just a passing, oh, dear God, you save them. Let's move on. Something a little more intense than that. Something a little more real than that. Because the reality of where they are headed could happen at any minute. We need to use that to motivate us to pray. Not to panic. To pray. Second, you watch. You watch for opportunities. Doors are going to open. Conversations will come up. There may have been a bunch of opportunities with Tommy. I have no idea. You want to know why? I wasn't looking for it. It's amazing what you miss when you're not looking for it. Have you ever been driving down the road with someone in your car and you pass them and you go, when did they build that? And the person goes, three years ago? No. I've never seen it before. Yes, you have, but you weren't looking for it. That never, never stood out to you. 
first time I came to your church. I was following, I'm taking you know, all these mental notes of landmarks. Okay, there's this, there's that. Okay, turn where it says Mennonite Church. Okay, got a bubble, bubble, bubble. Hey, I'll just reverse that piece of cake. Of course, the fact that it was dark when I went home really never had entered my mind that those landmarks were really, but I found some of the landmarks in the dark. Do you want to know why? I was looking for them. How about you? Are you looking for those opportunities? Are you looking for someone to say something or look a certain way or something? You go, hey, yeah, let's talk about that. But that brings up the third item. Are you prepared? Are you ready? If someone were to come to you and say, you know, you got this Christianity thing. What is that all about? How do I become a Christian? Are you ready to say, let me show you. And honestly, right now, your best response would be, well, why don't you come to church with me? Because <laughs> I really died on, hmm. Go to our website. Go to the resources. Touch how to mark your Bible so you can sit down with someone and intelligently lead them to Christ. And you don't even have to know the order of the books of the Bible. I'm sure you all do, but if by chance you don't, you don't have to. It goes by verse number, by verses, and books in the Bible, and page number. Makes it simple. Eight-year-olds can do it. I still use it all the time. Are you ready? Have you prepared yourself to speak truth into someone's life? See, what I did, I can't change what happened to Tommy. I can't. Game over. But I can use it. And I do. You see, because I'll be in the grocery store back home, and I'll be tooling along, and I'll look up the aisle, and I'll see somebody, and I went, I went to high school with them. Have you ever had this happen? You know you went to high school with them, and you cannot remember their name for your sake of life. And you weren't real close with them, so it's not like, hey, buddy, because you never really were buddies. You were like, that's in the hall. That was about it. And my natural inclination is to go, got to go down the next aisle. I don't need to talk to them. Just makes it simpler. And I do that every time. I was like, I say, like, okay. And all of a sudden, I was like, what about Tommy? <sighs> Back around, go down the aisle, and it happens almost every time. It drives me crazy. I go up and say, hey, I think we went to high school together. I'm like, oh, hey, Wayne, how are you? You know my name. That's fantastic. <laughs> I can't remember yours. Brandon, thank you. But then we start talking, and sometimes absolutely nothing comes to the conversation, but sometimes a little bit does. And I plan to see. I remember one time I was at um, this one grocery store, my wife and I, and I saw this girl, Kelly, that I met in high school. I actually remember her name. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but I did. And I was like, hey, how's it going? We chatted a little bit. It was nice. Julie and I went through the line. We got in the car. We had to drive into Buffalo, so I'm heading up Route 16 into Buffalo. And that conviction thing starts to kick in. Well, you didn't tell her about me. Well, it really didn't come up in the conversation. No, you didn't bring me up. You need to go tell her about me. God, that's kind of awkward, don't you think? You know, I mean, I already left. I said goodbye. We're, we're kind of done now, right? And my wife has no idea this conversation is going on in my head. This argument I'm having with God. And all of a sudden, I do a few turn and start heading back. And she's like, did you forget something? I'm like, yes. So oh, what'd you forget? I forgot to tell Kelly about Jesus, so I'm going back. And the whole time I'm going, God, this is so stupid. This is stupid. I'm going to get there. She's going to be out. I'm going to walk through the store. I'm going to waste all this time. This is so dumb. You know, and let me tell you something. When God can convince you and guide you to do something, and you argue with him, you will lose every time. So I get there, I pull in, I have, you know, that winning evangelistic attitude. This is so stupid. You know, this, you know the, the love was pouring out at that moment. I go back in the store, I'm going to see you guys, there's no one here, no one here, see you guys. No, 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 no. Hey, Kelly. And I'm going on, I just said hi to her, and so I do it with God that she wasn't going to be there. I'm like, oh. I went over to her, and I hey, she goes, did you forget something? I'm like, yeah. Kind of. That's what my wife asked too. I said, there's something else I need to tell you about. It's the most important thing in my life. And I told her about Jesus. 
Did she come to Christ at that moment? No. But if she lives the rest of her life rejecting Jesus Christ, at the great white throne judgment, she can never look at me and say, why didn't you tell me? Because I did. How about you? You want some prayer motivation? I actually made this into a poster for the kids in my youth group. Revelation 2015 says, And if anyone was not found written in the book of life, was cast in the lake of fire. The part where it says, And if anyone, I put a blank. I said, Write your friends and leave them there. And if Kelly was not found written in the book of life, she was cast in the lake of fire. I didn't do that to make me panicked. I didn't do that so I'd be like, you know, ooh, I gotta start, you know, carrying around a placard with a John 316 on it and get like a rainbow wig or something. Some of you know what I'm talking about. All the years ago, what? Watch some old Super Bowls, you'll see the guy. Anyways, I don't have to do that. You know what I need to do? I need to get on my knees and pray. I need to be looking for every opportunity. And when the opportunity comes and I'm scared to death and I'm sweating and I'm thinking I'm going to sound so stupid, I take it anyways. There was a guy who had been doing beach ministry for 20 years. He taught it. He took groups down to minister in Daytona Beach. And he had this one guy who knew me, never done it before. And as he was going down the beach trying to witness people, he was just getting shut down left and right. And then he saw the newbie walking along and said, well, you know, I'll just kind of shadow from a distance and, and see how he's doing. So he goes up to this couple, he's super nervous. Uh, can, can, can I talk to you? And the couple says, sure. Said, and he starts explaining this, the gospel, but he gets the steps all out of order from what he was trained, and he's stuttering, and he's stammering, and the guy's listening to him going, oh, should I just rescue him? This is, this is embarrassing. This is horrible. This is, oh. And he finally gets done with his pathetic little presentation, and he goes, would you like to invite this Jesus into your life? And the couple sitting there said, yeah. All of a sudden it dawned on him. It's not about your presentation. It's about the Holy Spirit. And when we do it right, when we're living right, God can use us in ways you can't even imagine. How exciting to have a friend who's on this side and you talk to him and God allows you to bring him over to the side. Knowing that the future that you read in Revelation will never touch them. Why? Because you chose to say yes to God. You chose to pray for them. You chose to watch for him. Ladies and gentlemen, if the end game was for you to be in heaven, as soon as you accepted Christ in your life, you would drop that game over. But you're all still here. Which leads me to believe there's someone you need to reach. There's someone you need to pray for. Maybe you'll not be the one that reaches them. Maybe you'll just be the one who prays for them. And let me warn you, if you allow sin into your life, it won't work right. One of the saddest stories of my life was when I compromised just a little bit. It wasn't anything big. I wasn't doing drugs. I wasn't drinking. I wasn't stealing cars. God had convicted me about certain music. And I didn't even own the music. I didn't listen to it at home. Are you kidding? Any of you ever met my dad, you would know why. <laughs> He's terrifying sometimes. But I hung around close enough to the kids that listened to it in school so I could hear it. And God said, Wayne, that's wrong. I'm like, it's no big deal. So then we went on a family vacation down in Florida. Got a hotel. We're at the Gulf of Mexico. My brother and I, like, all right, we're going to go to the Gulf of Mexico. We're from Devilman, New York. We don't ever see this. So it was so cold. I mean, it was frigid. But it was the Gulf of Mexico, so we're going. So we're out there. And this is great, yeah. <laughs> we're in the Gulf of Mexico. And I look out and they have this, this cement wall. And there's a girl sitting on the cement wall. Now, I was a long ways away and, and shaking, but she looked pretty. So I'm thinking, okay, I can stay out here with my big brother and freeze to death. Or go talk to a pretty girl. <laughs> That's a no brainer. So, see you, Wes. I'm in. By the time I got there, she was talking to some other guy. And isn't it easier, guys, when you're interested in a girl and she, you haven't said a thing to her, she didn't even know that you exist, and she starts talking to some guy, like, yeah, about her loss, you know. <laughs> so, I went for a little walk. 
She had this really long black hair. And I went back to our hotel, and our hotel was like a big giant donut. And there's a pool in the middle. And I remember I walked in, and there was a group of people sitting over here. And it looked like the back of her head was long black hair. I'm like, no way. So I did the casual walk around the pool, you know, just being cool. It's cool. Just like you get me. And I walked around, and that thing happened where I saw her, and like our eyes met for a second, and she kind of smiled a little bit and looked down. She's like, all right, she noticed me too. She's like three doors down from us. I'm like, oh, I can't get any better. So I walked out, and she was standing on the staircase at the end of the, the way, looking out at the ocean. I'm like, all right, I need to here we go. So of course I did what all guys do. I practiced. Because you don't want your voice to crack when you say hi to a pretty girl. Hi. I mean, hi. So I made sure everything was good there. Hi, 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 hi. All right. And I went out and we, we talked. And I tell you what, it was like nothing I'd ever experienced. I was scared to death of pretty girls, but I was talking to this one like for four hours that day. And the next day we went for a walk on the beach, we were just talking, and in all that conversation, I realized she's not a Christian. It's kind of obvious. You know, when you talk to someone for a while, you pick up on those things. So I remember, man, I pictured it like it was yesterday, sitting on that same cement embankment, watching the sunset, and telling her about the Great White Throne Judgment and all this stuff. And when I got done talking to her, she says, I really wish I knew for sure which side of the throne I was going to be on. I mean, there it was. She was pretty much asking me to lead her to Christ. And you know what I said? Nothing. Went blank, froze. Why? Did I not want her to go to heaven? No, that's why I brought it up. But you see, there's this thing about disobedience to God that can really mess stuff up. See, here's the deal. God was not going to reward my disobedience by using me to lead her to him. He couldn't. He'd be unholy. He wouldn't do it. I wrote her later, 30 years later. Guess who's still praying for her? And hasn't corresponded with her for about 28 years. That's me. You don't want to live that way. It's so not worth it. Looked her up on Facebook, can't find her. I don't even know if she's still alive. But you know what? I had the opportunity. I chose to be selfish. I chose to let sin in my life. What's going to be your story? Because you're writing it tonight. You know, you, this is all part of your story. You're writing it right now. What's going to be your story? I have a challenge for you. For those of you who want to take it, we're going to do it in just a minute. In a moment, I'll have everyone bow their heads and close their eyes. And if you want to be serious about this and you want to be intentional, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Silently say, God, give me a name. And this is what I want you to do. If you're willing to do that, no one's going to be looking around, so no pressure. I'm not going to be telling one way or the other. Just put your hand up. And when God gives you a name, put it down. Here's the deal. God wants your friends to come to him more than you want them to. And he wants to use you because he knows how amazing and exciting it is. And how cool will it be a million years from now? You're walking on that street of gold, and that friend that you prayed for starting tonight walks by you and just kind of goes, thanks again. Wow. Bring on the persecution because that's worth it. So don't bow your heads, close your eyes, don't look around. This is you and God time. But if you say, Wayne, well, yeah, I, I really haven't shared my faith as much as I'd like to, or, you know, I really want to jump in, I want to go to the next level. Right now, just honestly, say, God, give me a name. Put your hand up, and as soon as you get a name, put your hand down and start praying for them. Right now. As soon as you get a name, God puts a name on your heart, in your mind, it's just going to come. You put your hand down, and you just start praying for them right now. Let's get the ball rolling. All right, as soon as you get a name, as soon as God pops one in your head, you start praying. Excellent. <laughs> There's a whole lot of people God's been wanting someone to pray for. As soon as you get the name, hands on. Most of you have gotten one already that had your hands on. 
Are you guys doing that? If there's anyone here who has never accepted Christ as their Savior, to be perfectly honest, if you died tonight, you're not sure which side of this church you'd be on. Man, if that's you, don't leave here tonight without getting that cleared up. Get it figured out. Let me help you a little bit. Like someone help me. I'm going to pray a simple prayer just based on Scripture. Romans 3.23 says, For all of sin, come short of the glory of God. I'm a sinner. I can't. I've messed up. I can't be perfect. My good works do not outweigh my bad, according to Ephesians 2.8.9. I need a Savior. And Jesus said, I'm that, in John 14.6. And then he said in Luke 13, 3 and 5, Turn and follow. Turn from your sin and follow me. And he promises that if we do that, we become his child. So I'm just going to pray a prayer. It's like an introduction. It doesn't end with the prayer. If all you do is pray the prayer, don't change your life, nothing happened. You haven't chosen to follow. To follow, you must follow. So I'm going to pray a prayer. You just sound and repeat it after me. Not aloud. I don't need to hear it. God hears it. It goes like this. Dear God, I admit I'm a sinner. I know I've been wrong. I admit I can't save myself. My good works aren't good enough. I believe that Jesus died for me. That he has eternal life to give me. God, I'm sorry for my sin. I don't want to live that way anymore. I turn my back on it. I choose to follow you. So Jesus, come into my life right now. Be my Savior. And be my Lord. I surrender everything. I demand nothing. Father, I don't know if anyone prayed that prayer or not, but if they did, I pray that you'll make yourself very real to them. Give them wisdom. Give them strength. Give them courage. Protect them from what Satan wants to do to them. I pray that they will follow you. And God, that they will be part of the rescue mission that they've been rescued for. And I pray for the rest of us, God, as you've laid a name on our heart, I pray that we will never stop praying for that person. And God, I pray you'll make it more powerful and more meaningful. Lord, I pray that you will give us your heart towards that person. That the ache that you feel, that they don't know you, that you will allow us to experience part of that with you. And that we can rejoice with you when they come to you. God, I thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're going to do in your name. Amen. Real quick, if you have something else that you can have if you'd like, besides the brochures up here, these little booklets, it's called The Greatest Decision. What it is, is explaining the gospel. Now, if there's someone you want to share your faith with, but you're nervous about it, I got you covered. Here's what you do. You take one of these, you go to that person and say, hey, Guess where I was Wednesday night? I was in church, and they were like shooting Nerf guns and stuff, and this guy is really weird, but he gave me his booklet, and he said to give it to someone whose opinion I trust. And I want to give it to you. Tell me what you think. And then I'm read it. And if they come back and say, this is the stupidest stuff, bunch of religious garbage. That guy's an idiot. Okay. They can come whatever they want. I've been called much worse. It's all on me, not on you. But they might just say, yeah, i got questions about this. How does this work? Welcome to the opportunity. Or maybe they would come to you and say, you know, this really connected with me. This is what I want. Cool thing is you say, well, I don't even know how to pray with them. Got you covered again. Right here. It has a model prayer, kind of like what I just prayed. You can walk them through it. And then on the last page, bonus tells you how to read your Bible and get something out of it. Because I don't know if you realize this or not, the Bible is a very large book. And there are no pictures. I know I looked. But this helps. Because some people say, well, I just don't even know what to do. And this helps. I don't know where to start. Check out the Gospel of John. Find out who Jesus was and is. So, these are for you guys, if that can help you at all. I would love to be able to be a part of, of your journey in sharing faith. So, 
Dai, dai, ti rubi a capo di me. Let's stand and uh, praise our Lord together, and then I'm going to close with just a little bit of a different ending, non-traditional.
I must not, I must not be a motivational speaker. I must, I must not, because I, I've been to the Super Bowl parties. I know that when Troy Polamalu is running down the field, go on, Troy, let's go. I've been to your houses. On the count of three, we're going to say the name as loud as we can. One, two, three. That's a little better. Now go after it. Go after them in the love of Christ. You are dismissed. Wayne and I will be up here if you want to talk. Uh, or if you need some camp information, it's available up front here.